a different portion of his life. Now it's Rich's Wrath, which actually is a more applicable name, I will say, like in many ways. In the same way as Monty once did nail like the th- sort of the premise where to him it was like because obviously everyone's just judging me by my Twitter. He was like, your Twitter's more like a demon that's like sort of like being summoned into the online space. And it's like, and you know, it just torments the real person, which is you. And it's all this as though, you know, you come out of a dream like, oh, what happened? What's all this blood and all this stuff? Like, oh, it's Thor, it's Thor and the demon Thor and just tore through the internet again. In many ways, you know, sometimes I do feel like that is the relationship. But then again, he pays the fucking bills. So just keep going, keep going, mate. Right. What I, one thing I want to ask you, actually, at the beginning of this episode, Rich, is bear in mind, you, we've talked on some of the past ones about you working as an agent. Like, the people you work with, is there actually, like, a website people can go to that have, like, who you're represented by and stuff? Because I noticed that's one of the things about a lot of the agents out there is that you have to sort of be in the industry to know who they rep and stuff. It's not really like, you know, like in sports, obviously, you can just go look whoever the most famous player is and who they rep by. So what's your situation in that sense, in case people, like, are wondering about it or who, who you represent or whatever? Yeah, so... um but I don't even know who some of the players, like, let's just stick with LEC for now. Like, I don't know who some of the players in LEC are represented by, right? And I'm sort of knee deep in it and I'm talking to other agents and stuff all the time and I get general ideas about who some of the bigger agents represent and who they don't. But sometimes they can just, you know, a player can drop them or vice versa or whatever and I won't necessarily know about it until next time I either talk to that player or talk to that agent directly, right? So right now there's no, like easy access like online database or whatever um i think i've mentioned before that this was kind of floated in a player association riot meeting where basically it was suggested that there should be um and what i think they should do which i think would be very simple um or one thing you could do is the player database which tells you like when the contracts expire um you could just add the agent's name like next to the player so the the players could access that because yeah i think that would be um, definitely beneficial to players in terms of like trying to avoid conflicts of interest and stuff like that. But yeah, right now something like that doesn't exist. So yeah, it's it's kind of just word of mouth. Like if you ask me, you know, who does this agent represent? I could tell you who I think they represent, but it might be outdated already, right? So yeah, there's no real way of doing that yet. Fair enough. Right, obviously for the LEC, in my opinion, it's actually probably the best league in the world to watch right now. I even say that over the LPL, by the way, because the problem with the LPL is the bottom teams are dreadful, even if there, there are so many really good teams. So I think in the fact of like, it, it, like listen, I know people are going to meme on like SK and Astralis and stuff. Mate, even those teams will still steal a best of one every now and then. And I actually think now that you look at the other teams and what they made the moves, dude, this league is wide open. This looks amazing, the league actually right now. Like, obviously there's teams that have started off super hot. Maybe you don't think will end hot. There's teams that haven't started as hot that you reckon will be good by the end. So playoffs could be amazing for this one. So I, I want to start here. Obviously, one of the big pieces of news is we're going to lose one of the organizations from the LEC already. And amazingly, it isn't fucking XL or Astralis is actually a team selling in this case, not being kicked out, and it's obviously going to be Schalke. I know they go no fear, but I'm not German, so I just call it Schalke, don't I? So the team uh, people might know was the one that had obviously the two. I'd say like one was the Miracle Run, that was even a pretty good name for it. It was like a mad one-off run in summer last year where they obviously made the playoffs and doing so they helped Fnatic make the playoffs and they had that crazy like you know they even started off winning. Then in the in the spring split for me that was just a legit run. They're actually just a good team at that point in time. You know that wasn't there's no miracle involved. They actually I mean they straight up almost did just beat G two like they were they were very impressive. So to lose this team right. There's a million ways you can go on this angle. Obviously, people are going to think of like the team in the game. Did they like them? Are they going to think of like if they like some of the players? Obviously, the hype story of these last two splits might be one. I wanted to start on the business side of things, though. So, Rich, obviously, people know your org when you were with H2K was actually one of the main sets of people who were on the vanguard of pushing for things like franchising and the idea that like you basically there has to be a change to how the ecosystem is run. Otherwise, it's like an arms race between like 50 teams all just bodying each other on how much you pay. So what are your thoughts on what it actually means for the league? I know in the past episode you said basically like you're going to basically make money if you sell at the price that they've been quoted at. It was like 26.5 million euros, I believe. Obviously, the buy-in on paper is 10 million. Even then, I don't think a lot of fans know this. Most of those buy-ins for leagues are not like you really give them 10 million. It's not like Scrooge McDuck. You don't give them a fucking sack of gold. Like most of that's like it essentially it vests over time, you know, like you start out, maybe you pay like, I don't know, I'd say like half a million, a million or something. And then you, the idea is over the years, you pay part of that fee. And so what do you think actually on the business side of this, like implications for like, do you, for example, will this now be maybe be a gold rush and some of the smaller orgs that haven't been good? They'll try and sell for 20, 30 million. 
is it actually good that like as an org are they one of the ones that you would have been more sad to see go or stay where do you want to attack this one from rich yeah so this is something where there are lots of different ways to look at it um it all comes down to timing and also it's ultimately going to come down to hindsight because the question like basically if you want to be in lec if you buy a franchise slot in lec or indeed lcs or whatever and you believe that by using that asset alone to garner incoming uh, income streams, you will most likely never be successful, right? You will most likely always be running at a deficit. The yes. way the salaries work and they inflate, even if you become more successful, your overhead's going to be more by definition. Like, that's just how it works. So if you are if you go into LEC perpetually th thinking you're going to run this uh, run this company perpetually and you don't have an exit strategy, it's going to be a bad business move most likely. Now, if you bought in with the intention of selling at some point down the line, there's a very real chance that you can make a significant amount of money from doing it, right? Um, and when it comes to Schalke, they've been forced into this corner because obviously the situation with their football team and sure. the sort of parachute uh, from the uh, going down divisions, all the rest of it. So for them, it's kind of a no brainer. They were always a team who kind of operated within their means anyway, which is neither a good thing or, or a bad thing. Um, it's a fiscally sound thing to do, I guess you could say. But obviously, you know, some people don't like that. Riot don't necessarily like that. And I think... From Schalke's perspective, um, I think obviously it makes perfect sense, right? They're going to basically triple or uh, 3x of what they paid for it. That doesn't mean that there weren't costs on the interim, as some fans might think. Like, haha, they literally just made three times their money. Like, it's not quite how of it course. works. Yeah. But in terms of like, if I was told, like, if I was just given the keys to an LCS slot and told, like, can you sell now? Basically, the calculation I have to do in my head is how likely is it that the revenue streams and the salaries go up? Because if I'm looking to sell, salaries going up isn't actually necessarily a bad thing. Let's say that one million sponsorship in sponsors comes into the entire league this season, right? And that gets spread out evenly. And then the salaries are all adjusted to account for that, right? But they're still all losing money because obviously just the element of competition means that some people are willing to stretch and then other people are forced to stretch to reach after them. If you just increase those numbers, even if you're still at a loss, as long as the ratio of the loss is similar. So, for example, now it goes to 10 million, but I'm still losing, you know, I'm 20 percent at a 20 percent deficit. My slot is worth more simply because the numbers I'm dealing with are bigger. It's right. like if you deal with any company in the world, if it's a million dollar company and in debt, it's worth X amount of money. If it's a billion dollar company and it's the same amount of uh, percentage wise, the same amount in the same amount of debt, it's worth astronomically more. Yes. Right. So yes. I would be trying to basically pick my moment where I think this is going to be at, at its peak. And that's scary, right? That's unknown. Like, there's no sure. guarantees on that. But if I had to guess, I would say it's probably not at its peak right now. I think there's a very high likelihood that in a couple of years' time, imagine a G2 or someone, you know, we saw one of the deals that TSM did, right? Imagine this becomes more of a staple or more commonplace and teams in general push the income numbers up and they also push the salary numbers up. Even if I'm barely holding on, right? Like I'm not getting most of this money. I'm getting some of it sure. and I'm not paying my players as much. It doesn't matter because they're buying the slot they're not buying your situation yes. so i'd be trying to put myself in a position where instead of selling for 30 million maybe i can sell for 60 million in two years and i don't think that's far-fetched so for all of the stuff i've said about you know lec not being a, a viable business plan in the past whatever i absolutely stand by that i think 90 percent of what i said was completely correct and justified and even vindicated but that is working on the assumption that you're in it for the long haul that basically this is your baby and you have no intention of selling and in my opinion if you have do that you, you're gonna have a very small likelihood of ever making a return on it if your goal was always to sell there are definitely ways you can do that and as for schalke's position i mean it wasn't even really a choice right they just kind of had to find the best buyer and get the best value that they could and for the situation as it is now considering they're basically backed or against the wall i think it's good business overall by them i would say okay what do you think wicked obviously take any angle you want on this so i think more from the community perspective i think Schalke was a good team to have because they did make content they did try they didn't just go in and give up like they even failed the first time around or they got kicked out um but i don't think they were exceptional either I want to see teams do much more for the community in terms of content. Like I've recently seen Astralis actually starting to put out content. And I think it's really important because it grows the entire business all around for everyone. And it's the same with LEC. LEC is doing amazing content now. And I felt like Shelku could have done more, so I'm not necessarily sad to see it. 
but I'm not happy either. It's just somewhere in between. Yeah, one thing actually to, as an addendum to what you were saying there, Rich, if people don't understand the premise, because that might have sounded complicated, the part about like the, the ratio of the debt has to remain the same. So, uh, let me put it this way. Here's a way to explain it to someone as a thought exercise, right? The team buying in, so we're talking about Schalke, the org, obviously did not have a massive amount of money. I mean, despite the fact I'm pretty sure Riot was like chuffed, like, oh, I've got a fucking sports team. It's like, yeah, not a very good German sports team, you moron. You haven't got like PSG or something like you might actually spend, you know, fucking tens of millions. So when they got this team, right, obviously they aren't a team that was trying to break the bank. They actually were one that, as far as I can tell, min-maxed most of the time. And by the way, did a fantastic job. Like if I was to tell anyone in the... Uh, of LEC bear in mind to win you have to just have all the money and be amazing like they basically had to be amazing with fuck all money I would think they did a very good job if you look at how they performed over the years if you look at even some of the players by the way tell you what whoever actually was doing the real recruiting at Schalke has a fucking eye test look at some of the people they picked up they picked up all the people that everyone now would go well, everyone knows fucking Adu Amni and upset a grit well you, you wouldn't believe how many people didn't want him you know, like fucking Otto Amnad, no way he could go upset. Like, everyone was saying the same shit back then. Yeah, he's good, but can he actually win a new team or whatever? Like, fucking Bozo sports takes. Like, so everyone now will say they're sick. These guys, they got these players into their team at perfect time relative to the value of the, the, the market and what they could pay. So here's what you got to think of. The team that buys their slot isn't buying their slot to say, cool, can I just pick up where you left off and be a shit tier team at the bottom and have to book them? Or if someone buys the spot, think of it like Rich says, say all the revenue increases but all the ratios stay the same well now i could potentially sell the slot for even more because the person buying in wants to do something with that spot like maybe they want to be the best team in the league maybe they want to like actually be g2 competitor so now they're not just buying it for the spot anymore they're buying it for what they could do with it so of course it could be worth way way more like like if they're going to spend i'll make up a number here like five million player roll salary all of a sudden they might pay five million extra to buy the slot like it's the opportunity cost almost you're adding up there so you know i think that definitely is the case i do think that's the sad part for me like I don't get that hype like I said this on some insight it's not like they're a fucking legacy org guys people are acting like you know fucking fanatics like leaving or something no like difference is those orgs have incredible history that it would be really a blow for you like I, as much as our meme on fanatic being shit financially it'd be very very sad if they ever have to fucking shut that org down or just leave esports and games like League of Legends it will actually ruin part of the history but I will say like I said the thing I will miss with Schalke is I quite frankly don't trust most of the bottom feet Orgs, and especially no one knew until I've seen it to actually be able to like, properly run a team like Schalke did. Like I said, for the amount of money that they were putting in and some of the like players, again, they also didn't have their pick of the litter, even if they had the money, by the way. Most people obviously wanted to go to other teams. So I have to say, I thought they did a fantastic job competitively. Like, I, I don't think you can really say they did much wrong in that regard, especially with all the roster moves. Again, they didn't even have a choice half the time. Like, they had that problem we used to have back in Counter-Strike when the scene was very small, which is if you're not the top org, what happens is, say you're like the third best Swedish Counter-Strike org, what happens is you find a player, great, you did an awesome job scouting, he's brilliant. Yeah, good luck, next year he goes to like Fnatic or SK Gaming and now you lose him. And now guess what? Not only do they have your sick player you found, you now have to go find another guy who's the next one of them. And you know what? I think people can see where this is going. You can guess what happens when you find him. He goes to fucking Fnatic and then he's in the other. And eventually you're just like, do I ever get a chance? Well, the stupid thing about LEC is in theory you are supposed to. Like in theory, it's supposed to mean like some of the parameters are the same. And beyond people like G2, you know, spending mega bucks on people. If you're shrewd, especially with like the limited bottleneck from the RLs now, you should actually be able to get good players, even on some of these lesser teams. So I think that's the biggest shame for me because I don't know who this BDS... Do you actually know anything about them, Rich? I know fuck all about this org. So I, I have no reason it's to be uh... It's a French org who um, kind of wanted to go in and basically spend a lot in France to do well in France. Um, they didn't win their own region because another roster, I mean, the team that won EU Masters, right, was in, in their region. But um, I think they mean business, so to speak, as in they're not going to come in and, and uh, you know, try and min-max in terms of salaries versus income. Like, I think they will try and spend. I think they'll try be more try to be more than just an also run um i don't find the brand inspiring i don't find any of the sort of uh, attached assets that i could uh, look up to be uh, well even exist really like i don't i don't see them coming in as like a big name in the context of the league right they might have big investment behind them but to me it's not an interesting brand i think from like Riot's perspective unfortunately for schalke i think Riot are probably fine with Schalke leaving because in a weird way I think Schalke kind of 
peaked in terms of what they could do for Riot, right? They were meant to be like an also run in terms of how they'd been managing the team in terms of finances, in terms of not having like the biggest, flashiest players' names, but managing to recruit, you know, people that other people had overlooked or whatever. And then they go on like a couple of miracle runs. Like that's perfect. That's like yeah. the most you can hope for, right? From one of those styles of teams. And in terms of the brand, I think early on, because the the whole like football team thing kind of became a meme but early on that was a bigger deal than it ultimately ended up being right i mean yes. you alluded to it would be very different for example if i don't know a team like h2k had you know hypothetically partnered with a team like psg you know that would probably have been a much bigger coup for riot because a, a brand like psg it's not just a football team it's basically like a lifestyle brand like yes. they've done all these collaborations with like jordan and you know they're global they're uh, going into Asia in a big way, like that would have been a much better long-term play for Riot than taking Schalke. I think they're kind of secretly happy that Schalke is probably leaving because what can you really do with Schalke? It's yes. the middle of the line sort of Bundesliga football team, which has a bunch of professional standards that you could probably fairly safely rely on, right? Like they're very unlikely to get embroiled in like mass scandal or not True. playing players and stuff like that. So that's nice. They're like a nice safety net team. But realistically, if you're looking in the long term, I think Riot's probably not that disappointed to, to lose Schalke, which is obviously a shame. But I guess if I was them, I'd probably would feel similarly but i also would have probably wanted psg in my league so there you go by the way that's also why in my opinion we're gonna see like a, a less of the sports overlap than people think we are from all these franchise leagues because as you say there are certain football clubs like this is by the way the reason why people wanted to do something like the super league these brands understand they aren't just football teams they're not just there because they're the best fo like real madrid could not win the fucking like la liga for the next 10 years and sell a billion jerseys every fucking season because it's real madrid for fuck's sake like there'll be some little kid in india right now wearing like an old fucking Ronaldo jersey from like five years ago won't they of course they will you know, same as if you go to England this is why I said to me the whole European Super League where they were like oh it's a bloody disgrace it's like half the cunts in fucking my hometown are wearing Messi jerseys for the last 15 years they're not wearing fucking Harry Kane jerseys so like at that ship sailed that's some boomer shit thinking it's like oh, the, spot, the spirit of the game and that so to me now like the business side has overtaken football but like as you'd expect it's only a few teams in the same ways you're not going to find many people with a jersey of an LCS team who aren't like a, a TSM fan, a Cloud9 fan. Like, there's a few orgs that stand above. Well, what I think people like Riot didn't get, Rich, is they didn't get that this applies to sports teams too. Like, they really thought, no joke, when they made Overwatch League. I can tell you this from talking to some of the top people. They thought one of the reasons it had to succeed is because they thought, right, well, this guy who's buying a slot, if, 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 for example, here's the example one, say it's Robert Kraft who also owns the fucking Patriots within the same region. Well, he'll know everyone in the region, won't he? So he can get all the sponsors ships he wants he'll get like all these unique activation listen it sounds great but the point is does he actually give a fuck about the overwatch tt will he do any of those things is there even any crossover like you actually there's a lot of assumptions sort of baked into the pie that we haven't tested in fact we're sort of testing now because i have to say as, as you pointed out like there were much bigger fish could have been in lec i know people act now like well they had to take the first 10 they didn't like, dude, I know everyone's going to laugh now, but obviously the team in uh, Counter-Strike North closed down with Danish team, right? They were partnering with FC Copenhagen. That's a way bigger fucking sponsorship than Schalke. What? So, like, to me, like, there were there were bigger fish that could have been in LEC. And I actually think, by the way, now, so I want to get your take on before we move to the game-related stuff. I think it was a bit short-sighted, some of the people they let through the door, mate. Like, they, like I could have told them, even at that time, you are letting Astralis through and they're literally going to min-max this whole motherfucker. I even think, with the way they min-max, like, basically, like, abusing personal relationship with players, I thought that was disgraceful, quite frankly. I think that's everything I wouldn't want in a franchise league, you know? Yeah, I think they, they prioritised uh control over business i think one of the reasons why they may or may not have rejected psg from lec was actually not because they didn't want brands the size of that but because they didn't feel like they could control them especially with the who they were partnering partnering with right they just felt like they couldn't realistically control them or that they would be a threat or would actually be able to exercise pressure to you know try and push for things like more financial viability on a year-to-year -year basis and stuff like this they actually cherry-picked people or uh, organizations who they felt were did couldn't exercise this this amount of power or couldn't ever seize any kind of element of control over the direction the league was going in um and i can tell you like from experience and this is this was something that always really 
pissed me off and I, I, I just found it absolutely pathetic is every single, I was in every single Riot owners meeting from January 2015 or maybe even the one before in 2014, I can't remember, all the way through to the last one in 2018 and at no point can I recall anyone from any other team other than Unicorns of Love ever voicing any kind of uh hey maybe we should do this or don't you think it would be better for everyone if we did this it was always just head nodding and placating whatever to whatever riot wanted and just desperate and sweating to get their foot in the door of franchising and not basically rustle any feathers because they thought you know once they've done that oh they can you know breathe a sigh of relief and then maybe then at that point if they feel like they can start fighting for some of the things they should have fought for from the beginning um so yeah, I, I think I think the franchising decision making was m way more so about control than actually having good big business partners who could like elevate the scene, right? True. By the way, that has generally been the mo of Riot that I've always pointed out is they will always choose total control over more money. I mean, part of it's because they're a little fucking kid play like in their own sandbox, aren't they? Like they make as much money as they want off the game almost. Like I will say, by the way, that's why here's the real reason I don't give Riot almost any credit for the shit they've changed. Aside from the stuff that everyone told them changed 10 years ago that made sense 10 years ago and they finally changed it like 10 years too late. There's also the shit where they change it now, Rich, and they clearly were just told by Tencent, you must do that now. And then they pretend like it was their reason. So half the shit they brought in that we all like now is just because Tencent was like, actually, we also do want to make all the money. Like, <laughs> Listen, yeah. we're from China, mate. We do control and all the money. So, if anything, sort of met their own match there. Right, let's talk about some of the games then. Because I can already see Wicked just glazing over there. He's like, right, when, does, when does the business section... Is this the financial show? I thought I'm on the wrong show here. So let's talk no, about the, the game. Is, I don't really know anything about that, right? No, so. no it's, it's so own world, mate, it is. I just thought since I have Rich here, he'll be able to give me some insight. Right? Yeah, of course. A team I want to talk about immediately, because obviously they were in the headlines, is XL Wicked. So this is the team that... Obviously, they didn't have a very good start to the split. They've lost the last three games in a row. Basically, people were already pretty critical. Funnily enough, the one storyline that everyone was super critical of coming into the split was the one that actually we talked about with Amazon on the last one, which is that Nuke Dog's basically been actually like a fucking revelation. Like, he looks like he's gone back in time like three or four years or something. It's mega. But the sad part is wicked. It seems like he's the only good part of the fucking team at the moment, and now they've had to do these roster moves. So what do you think? Because obviously these roster moves they're making, not super well-known players, not big names, etc. So what are your thoughts on XL at the moment, mate? Okay, so my thoughts are pretty uh, split all around. So with the Nuke Dog thing, this week the teams actually just shut him down instantly. They ganked him a lot and so on, and he couldn't do anything. He was completely useless because he was focused. And then his teammates just fell apart everywhere, then he couldn't control the game. So it is entirely the Nuke Duck show, but I think the roster chains are really smart. And you say the players that are coming in, Advian and Makun, are unknown, but these players have actually been top 10 of the ladder very frequently right. in the last two years, I think, even. I remember back in the day, Makun was rank one, and I got him to make a tier list for my website, which was really nice. Um, I think this guy is How extremely How many years good. ago was this? This was a year ago, two years ago. So why? Oh right, I, th I thought you said like, when you sell like for your website. I thought you meant like ten years ago. Some fucking no, nah. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> no. Nah. So this guy's extremely talented. Both of them are really fucking good individually, and I think it's a massive upgrade because now you have two talents that can actually become super good players, and you just have to foster them. I don't know if Excel is the perfect environment for that because I mean the team's kind of shit right now. But if they have good attitudes and can actually come in and do what they're supposed to do and learn in a good environment, I think they're going to shine. What do you think, Rich? Yeah, so XL is like a complicated situation. I would, uh, disclaimer, like I represent three players on this team, one of whom has just been benched. So just so people know, like I'm maybe, you know, uh, exerting a, a small amount of bias. Um, I think uh, overall, I think changing something was probably good based on what I know as well for environment. Um, leaving jungle aside for a moment, um, because I do represent Dan, who was who was just benched for Marcoon. Um, I think in the support role, I think this was, in my opinion, this is like the the bigger or the the better, let's say, of the two changes. Just looking at it as a, from an outsider perspective, one because I think Advian is a very skilled player based on opinions that I I haven't seen like loads of material on him personally myself, but based just anecdotally on what players say about him, about how he lanes, about his awareness, about how his ability to team up with the jungler. Um, it seems like he is a, a, a huge upgrade on Denik. And I think something that's been overlooked is, you know, Patrick, again, disclaimer, another player I represent, I actually think he's been underperforming a lot, not just this split, but also last split. But I don't think it's a coincidence that he also had 
in my opinion, the tenth best support in the league both times. I think certainly one of the worst. Yeah. I think Torre was a horrendous support player, and I think Denik had basically started out the season like doing his best to top that performance from Torre. Like this guy just looks like absolute trash to me, um, which is a shame because I think in the past he was kind of unfairly treated but yes. versus how he was performing you know when he was on misfits and so on so i like that move um i'm interested i'm interested to see as well how patrick is going to perform now because ultimately nuke duck's a great solid piece he's al almost always like he's had blips in his career right but usually uh a sort of me uh, nuke duck in a, a mediocre patch is still a very reliable player. He's just sure. limited, right? But he's never going to int the game. At worst, he's going to sit under tower and clear waves and control his lane. It doesn't mean he's going to pop off, but, you know, he's a decent player. So, in my opinion, for XL to make playoffs, even if the team as a whole is more solid, Patrick needs to start popping off again. This guy needs to be the second carry on the team. Otherwise, I don't see them making playoffs still. Yes. I agree with that, with Patrick. Like, I actually thought when he came into LEC, he was a really good player. I thought he was an extreme talent, just like Upsetters, right? And Reckless back in the day. But he never really showed anything. And this week especially, he played horrific. This week specifically. So, I agree he needs to play better. Uh, it can be a lot of things. It can be the fact that with bad mood in the team. It can be so many things that make somebody play bad. So, hopefully these changes will make him play better because it's something that's necessary. Yeah, I think the sad thing for me is that, like, they, this is also just, like the XL story because obviously a mad unlucky team that they always miss the fucking playoffs by like one game, someone, some result happens. The, even in terms of like Ziggin and Zagan with the roster moves, like Patrick's best split in a few years was probably the summer split last year. Like, that was when I, even, even like my player friends would tell me, like, dude, I don't care where they are in the league. Like, he's actually, he might be like the best in any carry. Like, he's fucking sick. But obviously, now they get nuked who's actually good. Patrick hasn't been on the same level. So the problem they have in the team, like you say, Wicked, is they had one player, basically, and if he gets shut down, the game's fucking over. Also, the, the support thing, I definitely agree with that, Rich. Like, the saddest thing to me is this. Tora, who obviously was formerly known as Noskaren, right? Dude, he was so unfairly treated in, like, season nine, the season when he was with Splice. And partly because, this is how you know people don't watch the fucking leagues. It's just because he had, like, some hints at Worlds. He had some games that were shit. So people decided, oh, he's just trash. And then, obviously, he had that whole incident outside the game, which, like, soured people to him and he had to change his name but I, I noticed that storyline just stuck with him the whole time dude like the whole like the, for the whole year after that people was like he's just trash he's never been good it's like no the problem is this right is this one thing I hate in sports as well it's when people are totally wrong but they just wait so long eventually what they're saying becomes right they go see I told you it's like no dumb fuck you were wrong in the past and you are just now correct like it's not the same opinion is it like yeah he's bad now this is years later guys and He's been through some pretty bad teams, so who the fuck knows where that guy's head is? And then the sad thing for me was the Denik move, because he did look like he had mad promise when he first came in LEC. But I have to say, I sort of see why Misfits gave up on him now, because you know everyone was so shocked by that. We're like, whoa, what are they doing? Like, Denik and Kobe, that would be the team. It's like, listen, they obviously saw some of it, didn't they? Because no one's been able to get that form out of this guy again. Like, he's never been the player he was when he first came in. So it's a bit sad, actually, because XL again. How did they end up like this every split? There's a team I really wonder at. I'd love to know the finances of all the teams because I feel like this team can surely not have any fucking money. Look at the players they have to get me. They're always scraping the bottom of the barrel. What do you think on that, Rich? Obviously, you represent some of the players, but like, am, am I right on that one? They don't seem like a team. Like, put it this way, they're either making very weird moves or they just don't have the money to buy the big names. So I think that oh well, they don't have the money to buy the big names, right? That that I can I can tell you for sure. Like they're not they're not paying anything like, or they're not making offers for anything like what um, the biggest teams are. There were certain situations where there was like a, a S tier echelon type player that would become available, and they would basically you know discuss it or, or 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 you know have a internal conversations about whether or not actually this could be like a world changer for our all kind of thing so that they were kind of in the conversation of like if it's kind of like with cloud nine and perks although on a completely different scale right it's like if a complete team culture changing player becomes available they would be able to plug the finances in to make a play for that guy right, right. but as a general way of how they operate they're fairly fiscally sound as far as lec teams go in general they're not paying the lowest for sure they're also not paying near the highest um and i think the main problem they ran into to be honest again i think was support i think that so far as i would be critical of like decision making or whatever i don't think they ever made smart decisions about support and this was something that i was talking about 
with veteran the other day which i think he made a, a really good point which i completely agree with there are so many fucking good supports in the erls there are sure. so many take a chance on one do some proper scouting have someone actually watch these guys play properly make your own minds don't come to me or veteran or whoever else you can ask their opinion sure but go and actually watch the games i would say there's probably five supports who you could slot into lec teams now and they would be either as good or better than their counterparts so to me it's just uh, uh i don't want to say it's of excel necessarily because i don't know what the full process was but i don't see how it ends up with denik it just seems like there are certain positions that used to be top lane now it's support where people just get recycled over and over again perpetually when there's plenty of talent there don't just see eu as forever the sort of mid lane, the, the realm of the mid laners right like there's no logical reason why that would like always continue and why it could never be applicable to another area i'm not saying that eu is flush with support talent like it is usually is with mids i'm just saying it's not as bad as it used to be there are actually a lot of decent supports in the erls go find them right um and you know a, a good example of this i think and people including myself i again i didn't have full context so i would have personally if i was rogue i would have thought sticking with vanda would have made sense at the time but trimby was a guy that, you know, was obviously in their academy team. He performed pretty decently at EU Masters, although he did have a couple of pretty terrible games as well. But obviously they saw enough in scrims, they saw enough in in-house, that so they're like, we're going to give it a go. And you can kind of see in the other moves that they made, obviously like bringing a big name like Odo Omne and stuff like this, it wasn't like they were trying to min-max on salary or something. They legitimately thought this guy was better. And while Trimby had like loads of ups and downs last split, I would say, I think he looks really fucking good this split. So I think there's a lot of uh, support talent in the RLs. And yeah, I think XL's biggest problems have basically been bot lane. Um, you have one of the best AD, AD carrot if we're being generous and assuming, you know, because it, I, from what I know, I think Patrick has big motivational issues. I actually expect this guy to fully come online again, okay. this split. Um, so, but you've been, basically, you've eroded this guy's confidence and this guy's want to play the game by having two consecutive, consecutive horrendous supports. So hopefully, uh, Advien, who I believe is a much more talented guy, will sort of fix that. And if he does, I think, I think they'll make playoffs. If, if Advien and, and Patrick click, they'll make playoffs. It's an interesting thing you've brought up with um, Patrick being extremely talented and actually maybe coming alive. One thing I want to say is Krusa as well. When he came into this year, I was like, this guy is really good. I played against him in solo queue. He was one of the best players in solo queue from all the pro teams at the time. And it just feels like when people joined XL, they just went downhill. Like, I don't know what's going on in the team atmosphere or something, but it feels like there's something very wrong with either shot calling or something must be lacking, right? So that's why I'm excited for this move because I actually think talent-wise, Krusa is really good. Adrian is amazing. Makun is top talent as well nuke dog is good and solid and patrick was really good too so it's like every single player have what it takes they just need to bring it together there's no shot calling on this team though that's the one thing i would say there's no shot calling on this team like cries is a really good player as as uh wicked said like so many players have given me similar anecdotes about like how much of a beast this guy is like especially mm -hmm. on because you know he used to be regarded as like very small champion pool yes. only play only plays carries and obviously he's gonna kind of mechanically shine especially in things like solo queue when he's allowed to just play these carries and roll stomp his lane or whatever he's been playing especially last split and now this split like he, he does, has it increased his champion pool significantly i do think this guy's really good but he's not much of a talker he's a very quiet guy he's a very reserved guy he's not going to take the reins and shot call dan for uh you know all, all the criticism that someone might want to levy at him this guy was like Yankos in comms, uh, or let's say... I heard Yankos it was basically the reason they wanted him yeah. in the team. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. He, he, he's excellent, like, communicator, uh, regardless of what you might think of him as a jungler, like, very good communicator. And obviously, he's gone now. I don't know enough about Markoon to know about his shot-calling ability or anything like that, so that's a question mark. I'm, I'm neither going to say it's positive or negative. And Patrick, um, is, is, well, he's not a shot caller. So if Advian and Markoon between them have some good shot calling abilities, that'd be great. Nuke Duck, uh, again, on stage tends to be relatively quiet, relatively concerned with his own lane. Again, that's not a bad thing, but you do need someone to take the reins and take control after you exit the laning phase in particular, right? So if Markoon and Advian have that between them, then... I don't really know why people think this team is like can repeat or why they might be like the number one team and stuff. Like, Wicked, what do you think of the Mad Lions team at the moment? 
Um, I think Madelands is super good, and I think all their players are extremely talented individually. One thing I think is weird, like for example, Humanoid, right? He's a player who I would consider a contender for one of the great mids of EU if he keeps up his skill. Sure. But the problem is he tends to always have that one silly death where he just dies for no reason. This week he died just greedy basing halfway in the middle of his lane, getting killed by the jungler. And I remember at MSI, he also tends to die a lot just basing or doing something extremely silly, which everybody knows is bad, right? It's like super silly mistakes he keeps making. So if he cleans up his act, I actually think this is a player that could become a superstar. I just want to see it. Fair enough. What do you think, Rich? Where's Mad Lions at for you? Um, <laughs> I think Mad Lions is, and it's weird saying this like this early in the split, so I'm kind of taking account last split as well. I think Mad Lions is the hardest team to read in the LEC. Um, I think they have a lot of interesting flexibility which lends actually kind of lends itself in a weird way to like bo5s and i think they caught, caught a lot of people off guard at bo5s but i'm with you in the sense that i is it do i think this team's the best in the lec like absolutely not i think rogue is better i think g2 can be better yes. right obviously I, I wouldn't necessarily say that now but i mean mad aren't playing that great either their players are kind of weird to me. Like it's not just humanoid that um, the, these tendencies happen to, right? Kazi's guilty of this as well. Like Kazi's a really good player, but I think one of the main reasons why people have, or most people have been sort of holding off, like putting him into the echelon with like Reckless or whoever you have as like your best ADC, is because every time you feel you're about to anoint him, that he'll just do yes. something really stupid. And you're like, uh, like you can see like the level of in-game immaturity that's still kind of there. I still feel like Kaiser is kind of like the daddy in that lane more so than uh, Kazi. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's just a we and El Yoyo as well. Like I think the problem with Mad Lines is I don't actually trust any of their players other than Kaiser to be consistent. I think all of them can have pop-off games, pop-off series. You can string a run together. I mean, that's basically, in my opinion, what happened last uh, last split. But I don't really trust any of their players. Armut, to me, is kind of like a weird blend of, like, Vizicharchi in not one of his better years in Bwipo. Like, this guy can have really great carry performances, really pop off, like completely shut down the other laner. But sometimes he can just get really caught out. He doesn't seem to be aware of the map half the time or where jungler can be. And he just mindlessly pushes the lane and then dies. Like also his champion pool is a bit suspect in my opinion still. Like I think there's one thing in having a comfort pink. I think there's another thing in like, I just pick Wukong whenever it's open to me. That's like a red flag in a player when the, the champion's objectively like not that good. Right. So I don't know. Like to me, it's a weird team. I don't. I, I wouldn't call. La, I think it'd be grossly unfair to call Last Split a fluke. I don't think it was a fluke. I think the combination of some of the interesting attributes that the players have and the coaching staff have led to a win. But I also think there was some fortune, you know, injected into that. But I don't see them repeating this year. And I think it's one of those things where they'll make playoffs. But if they went out in the first round, I wouldn't be surprised, right? Um, so yeah, I, I I don't know. I'm not sold on Mad Lions. I just don't. There's they're not consistent enough for me. I think what you're saying with them being inconsistent and having a weird play style with weird picks and so on, non-meta picks, I think it's actually a positive instead of a negative because it's very hard for other teams to also read what they're going to do and play against it because when people are playing off meta, it's harder to practice against it because you have to spend so much time practicing against the meta picks because all the other teams are playing those kind of styles and champions. Sure. I will say, like, I do think they are well, very well coached team. They actually look like one of the few teams where you can tell, like, they all understand what the game plan's supposed to be, how they're supposed to play this comp, etc. I, I also think as well, like, like, but yes, one of the reasons why I was always super fucking horny on Humanoid when he first came in LEC, I think it's been borne out. One of the things I try to do very early on is I'm someone where I like to know, I don't like to know about people's lives in the sense that I don't care like who this like random kid from fucking Czech Republic is. But I want to know like, you know, what's their psychology like? Because I think that's way more like telling of whether you're going to become a great player. And if you think of the crop of players who came in, he's one of the only mids that has the skills and doesn't seem like a fucking nutcase in his head. Like Nemesis obviously had some sort of antisocial issues from fucking the beginning. You could just tell. Abadagi was sort of antisocial and like it seemed like he just didn't vibe with people or something it took him a while to open up a bit Larson is just a bit of a weirdo and then fucking it was even left that's just humanoid isn't it so 
a humanoid seems like a fairly confident person, seems like a social individual, has leadership qualities, even though he's still young in his career. He's played in basically three totally different types of team at this point in time. He's had all levels of success. He's been a world. He's been top eight of world. He's won LEC. Like, I think that, yeah, that, for me, he just checks all the boxes, mate. I don't know if he'll ever be like the greatest ever because he does play in a region with fucking caps and where perks came from, you know. Like, you have to do some really special shit if you ever want to be on their level. But I, of, of all the people who came through the last few years, he seems like the most obvious one to have success because as sad as it is a lot of these players are so young just having your head screwed on to some degree and being a self-confident person is a massive edge over a lot of other players like I've always loved the skills of Larson but I have no idea where that guy's head's at mentally like, I've seen him fall apart in a bunch of playoff series you know so like I always say to people even though it's harsh if I ever feel like anyone has like a psychological weakness I tend to be a bit out on those players unless they're like so exceptionally good like unless it's someone like Jankos where it's like look it's obviously not like fucking skill at stopping the guy making the finals, is it? Just something's happened to him every time he's in a playoff scenario. So like, I, I think Humanoid's a pretty cool one for the future. I think it's a, like, but I swear, I had this whole thing where when it looked like Fnatic was going to win, I famously said that like Nemesis would be the worst mid laner if he'd won the LEC, et cetera. Like, even if you say Humanoid is that, you're still a pretty fucking amazing player if you're on that list of names. Like, they're, they're, like there's no bad names on that list. Like I say, Prime Febovin is the worst on the list. Like, what do you want? It's not even haterism, is it? Right, let's go on the other team then, right? Wicked, what do you think of the Misfits team? Because obviously, I think they've shocked almost everyone with how, how this... Being ...out of his mind and out jungling basically every jungler he's played so far in the LEC, even in the game that they lost, I thought he played well. Like, I think this guy's just an absolute monster. And in, like, if obviously we're early, we're, what, seven games in or whatever? But if I had to, like, pick MVP of the split so far this season, I, it's Razork. Like, comfortably Razork, for sure. This guy's a beast at the moment. Yeah, if people don't know, the weirdest thing about that as well, because I remember actually when I did the Elitist United episode where we knew this guy was coming in at LEC, and it was, I remember a veteran saying, the bizarre thing is, when he played in the ERLs, his mid laner was that Milica guy who basically didn't make it to Vice Island, and then when he did, he just never turned up as a player, obviously, so you, and no one gives a fuck about that guy. Basically, supposedly, Razork literally was what, a guy who would just hard camp Milica's fucking lane all the time in the ERLs. So, funny thing is, coming in, it was the Milica guy who was mega hyped. Everyone's like, it's a fucking bad and then everyone thought I don't even know if the Razzle guy's good like is he just like is he basically just like the fucking butler to this guy he's like Batman like is he just doing anything but what's mad is you look at the players he's played with now he, he obviously had Febovan now he's got literally a rookie like it, it, clearly this guy is not just a fucking bot just camping mid lane is he like he's, he clearly understands the game and he knows when to play with different players no it seems like he has Zed crew done what's mad is I have to say obviously Deficio is a massive fan favourite, or not just, forget him, just fan favourite, just an industry favourite. So a lot of people aren't going to be like super critical of him. I think he's actually done a very good job with this team. I mean, I even told him when you actually knew the numbers in fucking Origin, he was working miracles in that team as well. He was getting motherfuckers to join. He had no business joining for that money just to come and play with other players. So when you look at this team, no one had massive expectations for misfits. A lot of these players, let's be real, they weren't like the winners in a bidding war for the biggest names. So I actually think they've done a pretty fucking good job with how they put this team together. Because when you're saying that, like they've got Vandas, they've got experience. It's also a role you'd want experience in. They've got, in theory, one of the best junglers. And it looks like he actually understands how the game's played. He's not just a fucking bot being called to the lanes. I'm still a bit quite... I'd, personally, I think the one that I have like a massive question mark on is the Hirik guy in top lane. Like I've heard a lot of hype, but I don't, I don't know yet. I'll have to see on that one. I'm not a massive expert on top lane. Uh, Vethio looks fucking sick. Then again, the chat pool is basically what he wants to play. So I think the pieces there, the problem I have with this team is, I've seen this too many times. It's like, if you ever start the split too well and you're just winning clean from day one, well, what do you think happens? You just go pillar to post and just fucking win every single game. No, what it tends to happen, unfortunately, is you cool off when the playoffs comes and you come like fourth or, you know, fifth or something like that. That just tends to be the way the season goes because it's also insanely hard to keep people on track that many weeks. So I do feel like eventually the burnout's going to come up. Other teams are going to get their shit together. But right now, I don't, I, I'm with you, Wicked. They're probably the best team in LEC right now. Like, oh, awesome. I, I kind of allude to like what Rich said earlier. On paper, I still feel like it should on paper be Rogue and G2, but it isn't. You know, it just isn't right now. What were you going to say? Um, also, one thing I want to mention with this team, right? We talked about Excel earlier having no communication, or at least Rich said so, and the team falling apart, even though they have amazing skill, right? If you look at this team, it actually looks like they build a team together. You have Vanda and Cobble, who I know both talk, 
and have good communication, so they can lead the game around. And then Rasak, as you guys were mentioning, is a beast. So it looks like these guys built a team. It wasn't the most high players, they just built a solid team that actually performs. And I think that's something a lot of people forget when they're trying to build teams. They're just thinking, this guy's a mechanical genius, get him, get that guy. This guy plays amazing, but it doesn't fit together. You need the puzzle pieces that actually fits into the puzzle. And I think they achieved that. Yeah, I kind of see, I kind of see uh, Razork and uh, Millis's like ERL relationship very similar to self-made and Nemesis's relationship when they were both in ERLs as well, playing together. Where it wasn't quite the same, or to the same extent, where people did generally think like self-made was really good as well, but the the praise was essentially like spread even. Like it's like both of these guys right. are really good in their ind individual positions, but as soon as you kind of either separate separate them for a bit and then put them back together you can really see like where the yes. value is in that sense right so i think that kind of happened with razork as well where it's like as you say initially he's playing with militia it's unclear although a, a really in-depth game expert might be able to tell you know who's doing more let's say but once you separate them and he starts playing on his own and he's playing with another really good mid laner you're still not sure because it's Feverburn. maybe Feverburn's having a renaissance or whatever and then you put Militza back in and it's like oh okay well whatever and now you're playing with um a, a, a french rookie a completely different player who doesn't have any real stock behind him yet like this guy at, at this point i think this guy's just proven right i mean people forget i think i'm pretty sure Razok was rookie of the split was he not in his first i think split? he probably was I think I'm pretty, I'm pretty, that was the I'm split sure when him was. and Feberman were going ham i remember yeah i'm pretty i'm pretty sure he was so like at, at this point i feel like there's enough body of work behind this guy to just be trapped like this guy it's not that he's playing well like i use that for someone if you know if i see jack troll have a good performance right. i'll be like he's playing what sure. like this guy this guy's legit in my opinion and then to your but by the way to your point of like start, starting well is like not necessarily you know a precursor to ending well let's say i think a lot of it obviously on the very basic level like okay if a team is cleanly winning then everyone's just gonna watch what they're doing right and be like okay well they're doing this and then adapt to it um but i also think and this this will apply to some of the other teams, you know, G two especially. The early season, early regular season, is so much about understanding draft and meta and stuff like this that some sometimes something will just click, especially like player for player. If you're dealing with like an assassin meta, for example, a couple of people might just really pop off. Who, if the meta shifts, maybe suddenly the team just collapses because there's a chain reaction, or it, you know, then it moves to control mage or whatever the case may be, right? But with uh, um, and, and with Misfits, it's like, yeah, they're winning uh, now. I genuinely have no idea what direction it's going to go into. I trust the bot lane. I trust the jungler. Um, I think uh, mid and top have both had good games. Uh, and top's had a, a couple of underwhelming games. But I don't think he's been like a black mark by any stretch. Sure. So for me, I'm actually... I'm not expecting them to drop off necessarily. I just don't know what's going to happen after like the the typical sort of mid season meta shift that's probably invariably going to be introduced. I I genuinely don't know. They're like a wild card to me right now. And by the way, I will say this: shout out to Deficio for being one of the few people who actually fucking understands who Kobe is as an AD carry. You don't put him in your team if you then want to have a fucking weak side top laner. Like that's why TSM was clueless as fuck when he was in their team. This is like when you see this team and you understand these players in their history. Like Deficio understood, I'm gonna have two six solo laners, and Kobe is going to be an AD carry who, if he goes to team fights, will do his fucking job. Like I always said, the guy is just like fucking poor man's reckless but he does the job really well like as long as you put him in the right team he's always going to be like a consistent player seems like he has his very good teammate just does his job keeps his head down you know and I, my problem with Cobb is just if people try and hype him like they did when he was in Splice be like he is the star he is the MVP of the league it's like none of these things what are you talking about you daft fuck he was that wasn't even the best in that team that team had fucking humanoid on when he was in his rookies playing fucking visit chat sheet. what you're telling me this guy was the fucking best no way but anyway that's that's by the by that was also RIP back when Norskaren was actually a good player. Just referencing that. That's how long ago we're talking about here. So. Right, what about... Um, we've referenced them already, so let's talk about some of the big dogs. Right, Wicked, where the fuck is G2 at, mate? Because like everyone thought this was going to be a boring year, right? They were supposed to have this super team and win everything. Dude, they're far from being a top team right now. Like, There's so many fucking problems. What do, you, what do you think the issues are in this team? I mean, if you just looked at this week, G2 was horrible all around right they didn't have anything good besides maybe wunder but in one of the games she was playing karma versus lula so i was like how are you even good in that match it doesn't matter what you do just throwing out spells and farming so 
I don't know. It looks like they had a terrible week, but at the end of the day, it is early season. We talked about that earlier, and early season doesn't really matter that much. I remember that I was a pro player. Once we went 0-4, 0-6 or something like that, and then we still won the league, right? So early season's not necessarily too important. I think the main thing is, can G2 come back from this, right? That's the question we should be asking. One thing that have been talked about a lot is they brought in Nelson as this coach, and they were supposed to be super hyped and super good because of that. But one thing that I want to mention is coaches, you don't know what they do. So all this hype is just air. And that's something a lot of people tend to forget. We don't actually know anything in the coaching sure. staff. Where, where, where are you at on G2, Rich? For me, the most... Uh, sim- it's weird. It's like if I was taking a, a fan perspective and going for like the, the Occam's razor, I'd be like the most alarming thing would, to me would be like Caps' performance, right? Like this guy, is, when he plays well, he's the best player in the league um, and often comfortably. Um, but right now he's not performing particularly well, like in his individual matchups even. He's getting bullied in certain matchups. Like Leader had his way with him. I can't remember the other game, uh, the other mid he played against uh, last week was as well, but he he wasn't playing well. But also, again, this comes back to what I was just talking about in regards to Misfits. Early season, and I do kind of class the first game still as sort of like early season, people are messing around a lot in, in drafts, like seeing what things work. I mean, the guy played Gwen. What, what else did he play? He played some other off-meta melee champion. I can't remember what it was. Um, but he was playing like these, these weird picks that he was first timing. Um, and not doing well on but you also have to look at the context of teams and what's important for which team so as an example let's look at regular season right for me if if uh if misfits play well all the way through the regular season it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do particularly well in playoffs if g2 kind of scrape through the regular season that doesn't mean we should necessarily lose faith in in how they'll perform in playoffs right and a good analogy i think for this is something like the phoenix suns right like i think everyone this season for anyone who watches the nba like phoenix suns had like a really good regular season but basically no one was like jumping on that bandwagon being like yeah they're gonna win and the reason is is because basically it's a new team there's like so many unknowns like you know devin book is good but like how good can he carry a team if like chris paul's not carried like whatever like a lot of questions and they're answering them as they go along in the playoffs right but still most people probably wouldn't pick them in like a matchup against the bucks or whatever right so it's kind of like you need to prove it and the regular season was important for them and how they perform beyond that's important to them the regular it's like the opposite for g2 g2 are like the lakers right they like they might just scrape through and barely make the playoffs but at that point, depending on what happens, depending on what meta shifts are, it could just be as small a queue as Caps playing well in the last week, but they, you know, still right. finish in fifth. That will completely flip my opinion on how these guys are going to perform in playoffs. Like if I see Caps performing the way he's performing for the next three weeks, let's say, but then all of a sudden he turns it on and he's hard carrying games and other things are falling into place, even if they're not placed particularly well up the standings, immediately they go above misfits in terms of like the likelihood of think who I'll think will win the split, which again, on paper isn't fair, right? But I think yes. you have to kind of look at these patterns and see what's important for different teams. And I just don't think when you have as recent uh, or as, as storied a recent history as G2 is, the regular season simply isn't important. You have a set of objectives that you kind of need to get out that you want your team to be able to do. Of course, you still need to do some of these other things. You need to win enough games to get into playoffs and you need to be aware of you know where the meta is at and all these kinds of things. But ultimately, if G2 make the playoffs, they have nothing else to prove to anyone in terms of the regular season. They do not need to finish first, second, or third, right? They can just get yes. in, and then I'll start judging them uh, their first best of five. I agree with that. And also, it's only been seven or eight games, right? It's been seven games, so it doesn't really matter much. There's two games difference between Misfits and G2, which is first and fifth or sixth, right? So at the end of the day, we're still so early that the games right now don't really show where the teams actually are because one or two bad games can completely change the standings. Thing is, though, I do think that, like, as bad as this sounds, it'll sound counterintuitive. It's actually a very, very tricky team if you're having problems to fix them in. This is one of the reasons why I actually think Grabs is mad underrated as a coach. Because, first of all, I already know from talking to players, like, he does actually have, like, a very good approach, as you'd imagine, of, like, facilitate conversations, don't think take things personally if a superstar player tells you he disagrees with you or he thinks you did the wrong draft or whatever. He's, he's basically exactly the sort of, like, m- mentality you'd want from a person to be, like, supportive staff like help people with things not be like the guy who's like 
Uh, you're going to do it this way. And it's going to be like, he's, he's not that sort of coach. But the tough part is this. When you have the players he has, it's just assumed you're supposed to win. It's In fact, it's expected. If you even come second, people will say you failed. But here's what they won't ever give you leeway for. They think when you have players like he did, that they're all just going to play at 10 out of 10 level performance. And then they're just going to win the games for you. You have to do almost nothing except draft the champions. And then blah, 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 blah. You get all the trophies. What they don't bother mentioning is this. Which player from G2, if they keep underperforming, is going to get replaced? Spoiler, none. They're not going to replace any of these players under any circumstances because these are the greatest players per role, if not the greatest, like top five ever from their region. So the problem is this, right? If you're the coach of this team, you don't even have some of the options other people do. Like, you can't take caps out, take the name player off and go, I'll take some sick ERL rookie. You, you couldn't do that. It's not even on the table. So now you actually have to do what I was referring to earlier that I hate the idea of, which is... If you're grabs, you have to be fucking Sigmund Freud now, mate. You have to get inside these guys' minds and find out where your player's not performing or what what issues someone's having with he gets the pick he wants but he doesn't perform or this player, if it's someone like Reckless, well, why doesn't he ask me for what he needs in the game if he wants more agency? You know, you're going into the fucking weeds now, mate, of trying to figure out all sorts of super complicated mental things and, and as you say, subtle things. That's the worst thing as well, Rich, is when you've got a team as good as this, you feel like eventually there's got to be an answer in here because of how many good players I've got. But as a result, it becomes like an incredibly complicated puzzle. You're just looking for what is the tiny little tweak that, as you say, turns you from just being decent to like maybe you're the best team in the league in week eight or something, you know, like. It's, I think it's ma- people really underestimate when you have players like these. It's the reason why all those like Galacticos teams in sports tend to fail. It's because one thing you're not doing is replacing players, telling fuckers that allegedly players play differently. Like, it's very hard to know what to fix. Yeah, I think... It- oh, sorry, go on, Wicked. I honestly don't necessarily think they need to fix anything though, right? Like knowing the players, I played the Caps before, I played the Regulars before. I think they're just players that need more time. As long as there's a positive team atmosphere, and I think they have that. Like from what we've seen with G2, they've always had a positive team atmosphere. As long as that remains, I think it's just naturally going to fix itself. And if you try too hard to fix it, that actually makes more problems than it helps the team. And that's something I've experienced myself because you try too hard to fix something, it just destroys everything. That was fucking. That, that became like incredibly poignant at the end there, Rich. That fucking line, the way he said that, line, like Jesus, yeah. fucking hell. You want you want to get on the couch and tell us about what was going on? <laughs> <laughs> Man alive! Even though you just meant it as like a passing comment, it sounded fucking deep there, man. <laughs> I, th- I think uh, I think one player who could be somewhat vulnerable, actually, so far as any of them are vulnerable, is actually Wonder. I think Wonder's the one player where the community has actually kind of been getting on this guy's back recently. And the thing is that this is one of those things where, like, memes come to manifest, right? Like, the whole, oh, this guy plays more World of Warcraft than whatever. Like, that meme's cool and fun to have when you are the de facto best top laner in your region, like, the whole time. You're not the best top laner anymore. You're just not. You you are not as good as Oduwamne. You are not as good as some of these other guys right now. So I actually think because of that, there has been a growing sort of unrest amongst sort of G2 fans, obviously in particular, but also, you know, general EU, uh, LC, LEC fans in general, that Wonder is actually not currently justifying his place. I, I, it's not gone that far. I'm just saying I actually think this guy is maybe vulnerable at the end of the split um, if, if things continue as they're going. Um, and ironically, some of that would have been to do with probably something that is, I would imagine, vastly overstated, which is how little oh, this course. guy plays league. Like, I'm sure he plays league a fuck ton. But yeah, I, 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 at least in terms of like what the fans want, because, uh, you know, taking your, your point and your philosophy of like, who do you actually replace here? I think if you'd pose that as a question, if we just like teleported back a year and said, you know, all, all things are the same as they are now. I don't think anyone would be wanting anyone replaced. They're like no, complaining no. about him, like, oh, this is rubbish. Why aren't we winning? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, who do you want to replace? And I don't think they'd be able to give an answer. I'm saying that I actually think if you ask this question in a couple of months, if all things just sort of continue as they are, I actually think they might give you an answer. And I think it might actually be Wonder. I think if they do choose to take Wonder, they'll also have Oscar in as uh, the substitute, right? Like for the second O team. And he's extremely good in solo queue. Like this guy is popping off every time I meet him. He's one of the few guys that actually puts pressure similar to what Amna does, right? So they have a very good secondary player as well to what you're saying. Fair enough. Right, All I'm uh, learning is that Wicked's losing every lane he plays in solo queue. Well, everyone's good. <laughs> Apparently everyone's amazing, yeah. yeah. Oof. Under all swap. 
Basically, if you want to scout top lane, just watch everyone dumps the wicked on his fucking <laughs> Twitch stream or whatever. Like, <laughs> what is your Twitch stream, by the way? Is it wicked lol on, tw- on Twitch? People. Hmm? Is it wicked lol on Twitch? I think it's just wicked. I don't even know. Wicked or wicked okay. lol? Not sure. You probably have wicked from back in the damn show. But again, we're only talking about the best players, right? So of course, I'm True. going to tend to lose to them sometimes, right? Okay. Yeah. By the way, I had a, had a side topic, but obviously both of you would be able to speak to this. right? I saw one of the things on Reddit that people were enjoying is as part of his streaming, Cadrill has like been playing all these lease in games, right? And he's been saying how he's going to get like to rank one on EU West and all the rest of it, blah, 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 right? But what people don't realize is, dude, it's implausible. Like, this is one of the things I want to get into, right? Because obviously, because of the connection they had from working together, right? Everyone used to always say, veterans, bad biased about fucking Cadrill. Shut up about Cadrill. But as with as with all these guys who have super strong opinions, LS, amazing, fucking veteran, what you have to do is take out the part that's just their personality, listen to the analysis, and just let it sort of like sit with you for a while. Because what you'll find is, even if you don't agree, you'll understand why they went with that angle. And I have to say, it didn't take me very long of like reading interviews, watching the games. And even though I never actually thought Cadrill was ever going to be a top jungler, like I always thought he had some sort of chalk factor or something about him just didn't work in the big games you just see the guy smart as fuck i even remember telling him half banter half seriously like mate if your whole thing is you can think really well about the game and talk really well about the game in english just stop fucking playing the game your problems you have to play the game and win like your hands have to win the game like you should just be a fucking commentator or be a you know be a content creator or something now i i, I will say i never tell people to straight up do that because you never know if they'll make it but to me it was obviously should do that so basically i want to ask you this rich obviously you have background with cage when he was in h2k and you've known him as an individual Basically, what is what? What's your take on him now that we know he's probably never going to be a pro again? Like, what 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 held him back? What do you think his issue was? Because, like I say, it clearly does know a lot about the game. Like, it's basically as far as I can tell, he's in the same position the Dan guy we referred to earlier was. Everyone who'd worked with them behind the scenes always tells me, oh, they like they're such good shot callers. They know every, they know exactly what to do at this point in the game. But if you were a fan just watching the game in the server, I understand why some players will be like, this guy's shit, or what? You know, does he do any of that? So, what's your take on Gadrel, Rich? I mean, the first thing is that I think people who work for Riot have way too much free time on their hands that this guy isn't even able to, like, palm solo queue to this point, fucking one-tricking Lee Sin. I think it's also interesting that it is Lee Sin because obviously, you know, we obviously we it's, it's hyperbole, but the idea that he's playing no hands, like, obviously Lee Sin is one of the most in- mechanically sure. intensive champions in the game. So that, to me, was actually kind of surprising because I was like... Okay, I mean, I've never seen Cadrill as someone like who doesn't have hands or something like that, but it's not been like his forte, no, no, like, exactly. particularly at all. And especially as, because um, um, I do think this is actually pretty interesting as well. Basically, every single jungler, every single good jungler, or most, the vast majority of them, started out as Lee Sin one tricks. Like that's a very common sure. thing, right? And even if they're not a least in one trick, like everyone has this in their locker. It's like supports playing Thresh, right? It's just yes. one of these things that like everyone has in their locker. But Cadrill obviously was a mid laner, so he doesn't really he doesn't really have that like you know those five thousand games or whatever of background that these other players would have had before he started playing the role. So for him to role swap to mid, uh, from mid to jungle. And then retire and take a big break from the game, essentially, and then go back and play Lee Sin only to probably, I don't know if he'll make rank one, but he'll probably end up like 1200 LP or something. Sure. It's pretty nuts, to be honest. Like, I'm I'm pretty impressed. But yeah, in terms of like what, what his strengths were and where he fell short, um, again, really, I think the comparison to Dan is a good one. Uh, I think that... They're both very good shot callers. I think Dan is more assertive than Cadrill. I think Cadrill is smart about the game and has good ideas, but it's not even necessarily how he's saying it. I just don't feel like as a person he's as uh, sounds as definitive or um, you don't, I don't think you trust him as much just from like small superficial things maybe it's to do with the cadence of his voice for god's sake like i don't really know but i never got the impression that people felt this guy was a leader leading them right right it's like he had the skills on paper but i didn't feel like it was necessarily translating like cadrell saying this so we're gonna do this it was kind of like oh our jungle is talking i'm gonna listen maybe and see if i like what he says um i also feel that he suffered somewhat from nerves on stage i think this goes back to uh, even his days when they were trying to qualify for the LEC with Schalke. Obviously, he was playing mid at the time, but I feel like Cadrill's a very nervy player, um, and I think that he suffers 
from no nerves in official games. Um, so those would be like the two main aspects because, as you said, like he's not mechanically the most brilliant player in the re- in the region. He is a very smart player. He's a very good communicator, um, and those are his strengths. And if those strengths suffer when you're on stage, maybe you feel nervous, maybe you don't communicate quite as you would have liked to, or you do in scrims, your hands aren't there to back you up or get you out of sure. jail. Then you, then yeah, it's not going to work out. Like he's still an L- like, I mean, I was assuming he's still probably like an LEC caliber jungler. He's just not top tier. Like we're talking like ninth, 10th place team yes. type player. Right. And for him and what he can do and what he can give to the community now he probably made the right decision. If that was his ce- realistic ceiling, then you know he's probably better off what he's doing now. So yeah, I think he had enough self awareness to to make that call clear headed as well. So I actually played with Kate when he was a mid lane as well in Copenhagen Wolves at one point. And one thing I think his biggest problem was was that he started out as a mid laner. If he had been the jungler the whole time, I think he'd been much better off. Because as you said earlier, he's a very good communicator. He talks and he says everything he needs to say, which is very important. And a lot of players don't do that. But the problem is, he was never this superstar. He wasn't like Caps or Frog and Bang in the day or whatever. So that was what he was lacking. But I don't think a jungler needs that. So if he had been a jungler the whole time, he would have gone much further in his career. Because actually, one thing I, where I thought we could also transition is to talking about active players is another player who, this has to be a mystery if you follow all the narratives, is fucking Kiri, who obviously is playing at the moment in Schalke. Because even though his end is the opposite equation, he's supposed to be some mechanical monster, blah, blah, blah. He's tearing up solo queue every fucking year for 10 years, Thorin. And it's like, well, let me know when the motherfucker does anything in LAC then. I'm sick and tired of this shit. Like, this is the same cocksucker I was watching playing Dignitas about five years ago, yeah? Like, the, like people act, dude, like this guy's a rookie. This, there's something going on here, right? Wicked, you play in solo queue, right? When you, if you play with Kiri, is he a top player? Because I've heard in like Solo Queue, he is very good and everyone does think he should be LEC, but every time I watch it, I don't follow Solo Queue, but every time I watch him LEC, I never see like the player that they tell me I'm supposed to be seeing. So what, what are your thoughts? He's very good as well and I also play on Team Kate or Kiri. I think I play on Team with almost every player, holy moly, but um, I think the problem is just he really gets hit hard by nerves. Like his play with nerves is like night and day, right? So his skill is there, but I feel like he needs a therapist on stage or a psychologist or something. Because it's all about the nerves for him, I think. I don't think his skill, I don't think there's any problems with him aside of mental. This is, by the way, I could give you a quick tangent on that. Basically, this is one of the factors that, like, me and Dom, whenever we talked over the years about jungle, one one of the, like, conclusions we've come to is the jungler... It's funny everyone in solo queue thinks the jungler's an asshole because the jungler actually necessitates that he must be an asshole because he is the guy who potentially says to two out of three people, I'm not going to come and help you. I won't be coming and helping you. And I'm going to go and help this guy that you might not agree with because I've decided that. Like, that's basically part of your job as the jungler. You can't say yes to everyone. So I have to say, when I look at the people that do seem to have this trend of they don't quite live up to their potential in LEC, it all seems like the same story. It's always that of like, look, if it was in a scrim and there was no pressure, Pressure. He knows every move. He knows where to be. He's doing right. But then when the you know the nerves hit and listen, it's obviously a role that's mega mentally straining. It's why I always tell people the best example ever for this was obviously that fucking clown that LS hangs around with Malice, who talks <laughs> like he is fucking peak dandy from season four or something. And this guy, remember, his entire experience is playing like look like fucking Korean challengers, and then I'm gonna guess like some low level European stuff or something. Like basically, fuck all. Because I always tell people like that. Look, it's nothing to do with skill. You just don't know what it's actually like to be in the chair on an LEC stage like that is a world you haven't been in and they can say it if I was in the challenge of career yeah exactly let me know when it's actually what we're talking about because that's the problem there's a like I know this coming from Counter-Strike you can actually literally never know if someone will make it through that threshold of going from like online player at home to land player like some players never make it doesn't matter how much talent they have there's even been players, by the way, in Counter Strike that were like absurdly talented, and they just just never properly showed up on land, you know, or they were good and you know, but they were like sixty percent of what they were. So I have to say, for jungle in particular, I think that needs to start being one of the highest um, scouted aspects of picking these guys up. It has to be like this guy has to have super strong mental because I'm getting really sick of people picking up loads of junglers that on paper are supposed to be really good, but as we see when they get their big chance, they, they can't do it. They just can't do it in the game, you know. 
I mean, I think you miss that there's, you know, a really nice safety net in Counter-Strike, which you don't have in League of Legends. Because, I mean, look at someone like Tens, right? Like, you can be a super promising, you know, prodigal uh, prodigal player. And then when it actually comes to it and you're given the opportunities you're given, you just don't perform as people expected. And instead, you go and become the best Valorant player in the world. You know, that's a sure. nice, nice little... Uh, Nice little career path you can do if you're a failed player in uh, Counter-Strike. Just go play Valorant and you'll automatically be one of the top 10 best players in the world. Brilliant. Um, but I think when it comes to Kire, like this guy is just a monster choker. Like just clearly a monster choker. And I actually thought like there's there's an element of if you've got a really talented player, someone takes a chance on him. Maybe he's nervy to begin with. That's understandable or whatever. Maybe it just ends up not working out. The next team then decides to take a chance on him. I don't have an issue with that either. Like, if you think you've got a diamond sure. in the rough, then, you know, fine. But at the point at when Schalke signed him, signed him, to me, it was just a straight-up terrible signing. Like, how do you not have enough evidence now to know this guy's just a monster choker? And I think what ha happened as well is, like, people that I've talked to in the scene, you know, people whose opinions I respect and stuff, they'll all say the same things, that this guy's really super talented, blah, blah, blah. He does deserve another chance. And it reached a point where I just started disagreeing. And I was like, no, he doesn't. He does not deserve another chance. Like this guy who maybe is like 2% less skillful, let's say, but hasn't been given any opportunity. Like I'm definitely going to pick this guy rather than yes. Kire if I have the chance. Like, of course I am. Mr. Seven Chances versus Mr. Maybe he's not quite as good, but I'm going to get 99% of this player yes. when he goes on stage instead of 50. Like that to me, at the point at which Schalke signed him, it was just straight up a bad signing. But I, again, I think it's kind of indicative of, you know, coaching and analysts in the scene is that they're so uh, anal about the the literal uh statistics or or sort of tangible evidence that they can get their hands on that aren't actually on stage and be like this is why this player is good and it's and they don't they just don't even understand that there's a psychological aspect and that that's huge so yeah i thought this was just a straight up bad signing i would imagine that they probably spoke to other people about it who probably gave them really terrible advice being like yeah trust me he's still really good blah 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 <laughs> sure. this guy had 10 this guy had 10 chances so like yeah. i would never sign this guy I think a big thing is also coaches don't understand what they're taking on, right? Like, personally, I think Kira is a good signing, but it depends on the coaching staff. The coaching staff needs to be there, and I think the coaching staff needs to make him more arrogant and more like an asshole to some extent. So he's thinking only about himself, and he's more ego in his play style. He just does whatever the fuck he wants in the game, right? If he gets to that play style, I think he'll be great. But the coaches aren't really taking that job on them. They're just signing him and hoping he'll be good from the get-go. And I think that's interesting is kind of the personality dynamic that you have on this team. Obviously, you have a bunch of players who are perceived to be toxic at worst and, let's say, alpha at best, right? Yes. Um, and, you know, including Crownshot, right? Like, Crownshot's never really been talked about as toxic, but certainly a forward personality let's say and obviously both leader and self-made are also forward personalities and then well, the genius there rich is obviously it just depends what room you're in as to whether you're the asshole doesn't it so the genius yeah. of crown shot's career is he selectively moves himself into rooms <laughs> where he's actually the cool guy in the room exactly, exactly. <laughs> i've always thought it's not this on his own he can definitely he definitely believes in himself let's put it yeah out yeah, yeah. I, mean, there's, him. <laughs> yeah I mean this is this is for sure the most arrogant team in lec right oh, without, sure. a, without a shadow of a doubt but that's not necessarily a bad thing i think it's something that's maybe difficult to sustain over a really long period of time but that's also why the one split thing is kind of genius because you're just going for a like all in on a world push, yes. right and you don't have to keep it together for that long it doesn't have to work for that long and if you get if these guys win winning is always the best short-term antidote to any issues you're going to have anyway regardless right I really love this team in, in that sense in how it's constructed. I think there's a level of self-awareness of how it's constructed as well. And obviously one of the you know the least talked about players is arguably the best player on the team, which is Labrov, right? This guy is an insanely good support. I think back when um, this was one of the, you know, back when uh, Gistic, uh, Kaiser was called Gistic and Labrov was also in the ERLs, that was a time where basically if you ever paid attention to the ERLs or what was going on, it's like these two are insanely good. They're they both going to be in, right? yeah, yeah. They're both going to be in LEC. Yes. Everyone else, maybe there's some good ones in there or maybe there isn't, yes. but they're, they're a cut below. Like these, these two are, are really, really good. And it's one of the rare occasions where it actually just panned out exactly like that, right? Yes. They're both arguably top 
three supports in LEC. Labrov's an absolute monster. Obviously, Crown Shot, for all I know, he could be like a bottom three, you know, AD carry, but ADC stacks to high heaven. Crown Shot's a beast. True. Leader's a beast. Self made's a beast. Are they all going to be, you know, are they going to be consistent and go 2 0 every week? Hell no. But that's why they're fun to watch. The big question mark for me still, obviously, is SLT. Like, this guy just, this, this seem really weird and random. And I guess this is kind of like, the most weirdly almost the most interesting part about the team is you make this conscious decision that you're basically all inning on this stratagem which i really like in principle but then you put in slt the only thing i can really think of is this guy must actually just be good and basically they scrimmed with him a lot or something and he just actually turned out to be good and they didn't feel the need to go out and buy someone because when you're dealing with the kind of numbers that vitality do have available to them in terms of budget yes. you could have gone out and you know tr tried to get bring someone in right if you'd wanted to i mean for, for lack of any sort of domestic options you could have gone and get a korean uh top laner comfortably right if True. you wanted to especially yeah. again if you're going for this idea that we're making a singular push for worlds yes. it doesn't have to be a long-term strategy getting an absolute beast korean top laner would probably have made a lot of sense here right depending on who it is so really interesting team for me they're the most fun team in the league um I don't know if I, I if I had to guess what's going to happen. I think they'll they'll go out in a really entertaining series in playoffs and fall a little bit short, just because I don't think they'll be like as much cohesiveness over the course of a best of five as the team they'll likely to be face will have. Like if they come against up, if they play rogue, they will lose. Absolutely, like it's such a bad matchup for them. They will lose to rogue in a best of five. That's a very cohesive, um, sort of beautifully oiled machine versus. Uh, ludicrously stacked individual talent. That's not to say that they can't get there themselves as well, just because their main branding is that they're all brilliant, like mechanical gods. Yes. It doesn't mean that they can't be cohesive, absolutely not. But we're not seeing that yet. And if I had to guess if we'll see it or not, I would probably guess no, but they're just that good on paper that I think they'll get to playoffs and I think they might win a series. But I think they'll probably fall just short of Worlds. But I really, I've never rooted for a team more that wasn't my own team to like make it work and really pop off and make it to Worlds. That's interesting. Like, I think one thing that's really interesting is you mentioned importing a Korean player, but do you think importing a Korean player would be a good idea if you have so many explosive personalities as Vitality does, right? Because I could quickly see that imploding on itself. So personally, I don't really know who else they would get than SLT. I feel like that's just what they had to choose from, kind of, right? Because upgrades in top lane is very difficult because you can get superstars like Odo Amne, and then there's not that many more to look at afterwards, I think. There's also Adam, of course, but he was already chosen. I mean, that's the reason I why I didn't yeah, specific... That's, sorry, that's the reason why I actually didn't mention a name is because I couldn't actually really think of anyone. I'm just saying that they had the reason sure. why SLT was a little bit weird is just because they do have the resources to basically get anyone they want. Other, Obviously, they can't get Oddo because he's yes. in a new contract on the shitloads of money. Like, that's not going to happen. So that's why I threw out, like, you know, hypothetically, if there was a someday in the ether or something, I would definitely go with that. If I'd already got these four players and I'm making a run and I've only got one of them on a split contract, hell yeah, I'd get someday. Sad thing is this, mate. I think the player that they should get is obvious. It's just that he already was in their fucking team. It's called Cabochard. Like, I don't know. I still don't understand how he is playing in the RLs right now. I don't get it at all. Because what do you know? Everyone was like, yeah, but he's a bit washed now. Thorin goes to the RLs immediately. He's just a fucking sick player again. Like, oh, when is anyone going to learn, mate? When are they going to learn? Like, it's it's like I almost need to actually make like a thing. Like, I'll give you a, a quick tangent. I should actually do this, come and think of it. When I do my rankings in CSGO, I do basically like the top 10 teams in the world. And I actually was the first person to do this. Like, HLTV Org only started, I think, like a year or a year and a half afterwards. Because back then, believe it or not, there just wasn't a top 10 like it, it was just fans saying this team's top 10 but as you'd expect they would just put about 17 teams in the top 10 so I just remember thinking I mean this is sort of my job as the story anyway someone should keep track of this like where who, who would be like the third best team now or you know if you're writing an article it's nice to be able to go back and go and they were actually seventh before that tournament but then they won and they were second you know it can kind of tell the story well in doing so right one thing I added in like a couple of years ago as like a change to improve that is I also realised it doesn't make sense to just make it like an absolute top ten like this guy's number one and this guy's number four because the problem with that is it doesn't actually tell me how good is the number four and how good is the number one 
because obviously you can have times where there's three teams technically could be number one and maybe it's a tiny fraction and, you know, they replace each other each week. Meanwhile, there might be a time period where the difference between number one and number three could be enormous. That's actually happened in Counter-Strike and other games. So what I added in was this concept they used to have in Korean StarCraft where aside from your ranking or your ELO, they also used to call you like a certain class. And so famously the, the top class, I think it comes from anime or some shit, was S-class. Maybe some cars, I guess. S-class is like elite tier. The idea is you're like the absolute best players. Like if you play a game against anyone who isn't S-class, you're expected to win the game, blah, blah. You get the point. It's like contender status, basically. Then they would have like A-class. And the idea is you're, like, you're still a very good player, but you know, you're not S-class, but you're also you're not like just a pleb. You're like, you're a good player. Put it this way. We need in history to have a, cla- a system like that in league because certain players, when you reach a certain status where you've played, I'm talking like three, four, five years as an elite level player in your position, you almost need a tag like that so that people who only watched the last split remember, oh, wait a minute, this guy was actually insanely good for half a decade because... I know I, I ramble on about it a lot, but I, I can't handle it when they do it to the like really good players, mate. Like the ones that like, because this to me, I'm not exaggerating. To me, what the people have done with Cabochard, where they don't even consider him relevant now, is like if right before Yankos won the championship in LEC, he'd had one bad year and you were like, actually, let's just get rid of him. He'll never do anything. So you'd have been an idiot, wouldn't you? Like you'd look so stupid now. And I think like players like Cabochard, they're in that category for me. It's like, I don't know how, how everyone in the whole league can just turn on them. And like, it takes less than a year. I mean, he's a top five Western top of all time, right? If you have like Fizzy, Soaz, like, Odo, yeah, of course. Fizzy, yeah. Soaz, Odo, and then who? Like Cabochard, right? Oh, well, Wonder as well, right? Yeah, those would yes. be the five. Wonder and Cabochard. Those are the five greatest yes. EU top lenders of all time. So, yeah, unfortunately, if you only started watching in sort of, I mean, <laughs> to be honest, even if you started watching like season seven, you'd still have seen some monster splits oh, from sure. the guy, right? So, yeah, it's kind of nuts. And also, his style of play, and this is where I would say, I mean, obviously, again, I'm biased. So, you know, on my personal all-time list, I'd have someone like Otto above him. But his style of play, and yeah, it's a very different skill set. In a way, it's kind of, in a way, it's more impressive to have that insanely, like, put all your resources to me and I will carry this mediocre team to do that consistently. That's sure. actually kind of nuts, especially like come meta, come 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 full, you know, to always play that style. Yes. And yes, yeah, someone could say it's a selfish style, but at the same time, if I'm on this mediocre team and I'm not Cabo Shot, I'm presumably a mediocre player. And if there's someone who's willing to take all the resources and carry me, then you know, is that a selfish play style? So I I don't know. I think Cabo Shard, when all is said and done in this guy's career, he'll be like a, a European legend. And my understanding is that basically. The it was you know one of these classic situations of essentially him and the coaching staff it was just a no go and right. their line is that this guy in their opinion even though that they weren't the coaching staff for the last however many years that they believe there was a time where it would have been worth it but now at this point in career in his career we're not putting up with this to get right. that on Implying the he's got a bit of diva. By the way, yeah. Yeah, again, he's also a French esports star. So mm. if you imagine someone like that's not going to have an ego, like you might want to get pull out a fucking like a map and have a look where France is and maybe have a look into their history and their culture. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. goes to it with their fucking hand in hand, if you know. It's not even a diss, by the way. It usually means you're a pretty sick player if you have a big ego there. Well, but if yeah. you're talking about cover chart, I also think it's important. I don't think he fits in Vitality's team. They have too many explosive players in too many roles and you can't have a jungler that needs to play around all over the map all the time so it's impossible to fit in that team I think if you want Kabata to have a chance he needs to play in a team like Misfits or something else where he okay. works with Kobe where Kobe can play somewhat passive and chill sure. and you can actually pull the resources to him right because if he goes into Vitality I think Kabata is going to look like the weak link that gets caught and die a lot because he can't get the help he needs to play that's, his that's a that's a good point one thing that I, I do want to say because this pisses me off about uh, the plebs are always spouting this online and it's kind of become like Again, like to me, this has kind of gone down the realms of like, it's just a cool thing to say. People who say like, oh, well, they should have kept Segenda, blah, blah, blah. And before I say this, I just want to make sure that this isn't a guy who's bodied you in uh, solo queue, right, Wicked? Because I'm <laughs> about to shit all over this guy. But this guy is fucking bad, in my opinion. This guy is just a bad player, bad top laner. At least I've not seen anything to suggest that this guy is good at playing top lane. So when people try and, like, chuck him in the same boat and say, you know, maybe Checo lad didn't have enough time, or same for Segenda, like, who, look how sick a team you could make if you got all the people who were unfairly... No, you'd have a shit team, because this guy would yeah. be playing top lane. So 
So, yeah, I think that this guy was not like... Uh, there are certain times where absolutely the players are dropped too soon or not given enough of a chance, let's say. I don't think that was the case at all with this guy. He was also, you know... Um, yeah, there, there were like copious amounts of trials and stuff like that where people were already surprised at how poor his performance was. So, yeah, this this I think they were right to to replace top. But yeah, I think actually Wicked makes a, a really good point, actually, that I didn't really consider. Which, so, yeah, when you look down the names on this team and Cabochard's play style, you're not really going to play towards Cabochard most likely. And if you do, like, how much do you fucking lose? Like, and if you play towards Cabochard, then your bottling is going to die. You yeah, I mean, you... Yeah, one of the things that you kind of, I mean, he can be sort of self-reliant in in sort of how he lanes and stuff like that, but you need to be near leader, at least, I feel, if you're playing as a jungler on his team. Like, I, if, if I'm picking between playing around leader or playing around Cabo Shard, I, I would pick leader. Sure. Oh, no, mate. I think I, this is actually one of the areas where I wonder how Southmade actually will be able to synergize with leader if they even play beyond one split, because who the fuck knows right now, is... Self, self-made style of play is a bit selfish but by the way he was just so good it made sense I agree like but I, whenever I think of leader right I remember the I think it was Grabs he described back in like season 9 you remember the split when Jankos actually won the MVP for Europe it was season 9 summer and one of the reasons why was he was just like absurd at like knowing exactly what lane to be in like where to do the gang and one of the things I think it was Grabs described was he said that like it's like you didn't even have to tell him. It's it's not that Caps would tell Jankos, like, I'm about to go in on a play like this. It's that Jankos would actually, like, read the map and read how the lane was going and just realise, like, I actually just better go now before he even says anything because he probably is just going to, like, impulsively go in in, like, 30 seconds. And then he said, basically, the way you knew that Jankos was, like, God tier at the time was it was like he would just arrive, but it's like one of those, like, NFL throws that the quarterbacks do. You know where they do the throw? that They, they actually aren't throwing it to a human at the moment they throw it. It's just that the, the, the receiver will be there and so it always looks like the most impressive throw right because the idea is you have to sort of like lead the guy and know exactly how quickly he gets to that so it's like that's what Jankos was doing for his mid laner basically he was just like sort of like fucking soul reading like yeah Caps is about to just go do a mad like 80-20 all in like so he just had to be there in advance like I feel like you need that sort of player if you want a mid leader to really pop off because what you want that guy to do is literally just listen I bought you for your hands mate if you see any fucking player and you're playing these champions you play fucking yawn the Viego, yeah, just go in, mate. Just, just, just go all in. Any moment you want. And basically, in in the NBA, you can say like he has the green light. You can shoot whenever you want, mate. We, you, we don't need shot selection from you, leader. We didn't buy you for to be an efficient mid laner, did we? Like, because like, that's, that's it's just, it's like what you were saying earlier. I agree. I can't believe anyone's hating on this team, mate. You might not think they're good, but. F- they're fucking entertaining because the sheer skill level of the players means even though, yeah, League isn't a game where you just like use your hands and beat everyone, it means that there's going to be the odd game though where they're just going to absolutely shock the world. So uh, I, I, I can't wait to see them play in the playoffs. I mean, like we had that against G2 this week where they just absolutely sure. stomped him. Kevska completely stomped. He couldn't do yes. anything with his grin. Yeah. And they even completely counterpicked his grin. Like yes. he picked his grin, they pick a full range comes where grin can't do anything. And then leader had rise, and they just absolutely stumped him, and he couldn't do anything at all in the entire game. What were you going to say, Rich? No, I was just going to say like this is the kind of team where they could lose like a Bo five to SK probably, but they could also beat like a Chinese team in a Bo one. You know, like yes. a, a top Chinese team in a Bo one. Like they, they just have that ability to pop off in so many different positions. I mean, even Crown Shot, like Crown Shot, it hasn't. Uh, done it as much I think uh, but um, I remember in his initial splits sometimes he just kind of like force the engage and like go in before his support yes. and take these kind of weird like I feel this is sort of a 60-40 in the other team's favour kind of trade but he just like brute force it and make it work more often than not like a- any of these you know uh, three main positions on the map can pop at any given moment and as I said I just really hope that they do manage to get some kind of level of of consistency or I would say a system which works for them because yeah they're by far the most fun to me and also all three of these guys are like a fucking great interview right like I'd much rather consider like how much press and stuff you get around particularly around worlds or whatever I'd much rather have these group of individuals there like hyping up Europe and hyping up the tournament than a bunch of like, you know, yes answers, one word answers to some other nonsense from a bunch of like PR whores. So yeah, I'm really rooting for this team to get to Worlds. 
One thing I'll also add in, because I actually have never mentioned this when I've talked about them as a squad, but you alluded to it earlier. A lot of fans really don't get it with Vitality, especially, I think, in part, Rich, because last year they sort of gambled on a bunch of rookies and they kept cycling in the junglers and stuff. So it made their team look like, oh, are they just a team like an SK or, you know, a Schalke that has to sort of bottom feed and get like, you know, like unknowns or people are known. No, Vitality has had money this whole fucking yeah. time. And if people only knew, I mean, I might even be at the point now where I could probably start revealing some of it, but maybe I'll, I'll wait a couple of months. I'll wait it gets a bit spicier. I'll start telling people some of the fucking super teams I was hearing that they were trying to make in the off season. Like if you, if you think out there as a fan, like the dream was perks going to Fnatic. It wasn't like that wasn't yeah. a dream. Like there were lineups, like there was a couple in America and there was a Vitality one in Europe where like they were trying to make, like again, as you alluded to actually with the whole Jack and Cloud Nine thing, you don't just make the team even if like two people won't join these are the teams where I'm only pulling the trigger on these massive signings if like player one and player two say yes and spoiler player one said no so like basically the the chain of dominoes never got activated but fucking hell they were going big boys like they were lit- like everyone who thinks that shit of like oh G2 ruined the league dude they would have had a roster like G2s it would have been really sick so that makes me also think for the future it's a bit like in CSGO the team I always give the equivalent to is FaZe Clan because FaZe Clan just consistently will spend money and they will spend money on big names that their players want well the good news about that is it means even if this lineup doesn't work they can make the one upgrade every time that potentially could. So even if they have, don't end up doing it, it means that you always have a chance this team could be a contender. So for me, it doesn't even matter, by the way, if this particular lineup's awesome. Maybe this lineup doesn't work, and let's pick who it might be. Maybe they don't go with the SLT guy. Maybe Self Made leaves. They got the money and the fucking ambition that as long as they like the other pieces, they can just put some other great players in there. So the cool thing for me is I think in the future, at least, Vitality is going to be like a major player in the LEC. I'm already surprised that they had that many seasons that were bad. But then again, yeah. things like the Melissa thing, like that's just unlucky, mate. You can't mm. know if that's going to happen the way that went, you know? Yeah, you might say Vitality nearly had a team like G2 or like Fnatic. Hmm. But yeah, that exactly. was a, yeah, no, that was a, Pretty, pretty banging and I, I do I do find that kind of surprising and I do think I mean you do ultimately have to look back especially when we were talking about Schalke earlier and maybe suggest that Vitality is underperformed considering the resources they have had access sure. to and been willing to spend over that time versus someone like a Schalke who I'll just sort of take an arbitrary number but let's say who have spent half as much as Vitality and yeah. achieved more basically yes. so yeah but no I agree I think Vitality is is uh especially I mean especially now like living in the moment definitely a fun team to watch but they should be I mean Vitality is the team that I'm predicting to basically leapfrog fanatic kind of org viability wise through a player's eyes over like the next couple of years I think these two teams are just going to go straight past each other in the elevator Right, here's the thing, Wicked. I or don't I, I, I don't believe we have to talk about every fucking team. So I'm I'm just gonna say we're not gonna talk about Schalke and SK. I mean the only reason we really talked about XL is because they had the roster moves. But there's obviously two top teams we have to talk about. One is Rogue, which to me is interesting in itself because every single person who follows LEC knows Rogue is one of the best teams. But they're not the best at the moment, so there's already some interest in there. So let's start with them. Wicked, what's the, what's holding Rogue back? Because to me, it's like they have everything on paper. They have the roster. They even obviously were really good in spring. They do win most of their games. They're always good in the fucking meta. They have one of the best early games. Like like on paper, shouldn't this be the best team in LEC? Um, I mean, earlier we talked about Misfits being the best team, right? I think Rogue, if you only look team, not performance wise, I think they're the best actual team. They play well together. They make sure to always. Think about each other's movements before doing something. Like, for example, this week in um, the games, Hansamo made a play just as Oramna had TP and the enemy top laner didn't have TP. And that's something we see, for example, with Tyler team messed up because they're ego players to some extent. They don't really care as much about their teammates. I think there's a very well-oiled machine that's going to continue running really well and it's only going to get better from here. So I'm extremely excited about Rogue and I think they're not going to have problems where they're going to implode and explode as a team. I just think it's going to be solid the whole way through. And I'm pretty confident they're going to make at least top three, probably top two. Okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, to me, if uh, I would have made Rogue like pre-split favorites to win, um, I think G2, obviously, they're always going to be there or thereabouts in in people's thinking, right? But I felt that the gap between a team like Rogue and a team like G2 last split was quite big. So even if G2 closed the gap, I would expect Rogue to beat them in a best of five, if I had to guess. I think that 
Rogue are by far the cleanest team, as certainly at least early game in um, in LEC. There may be teams that are sort of better at closing it out, and I would say that's kind of where their weaknesses lie to a certain extent. They seem to just passively get insane gold leaves without really doing anything to like the casual viewer's perspective, right? They just look away from their screen like no one's died, like no towers have gone down. It's like, why does Rogue have a 4K gold lead at 10 minutes, right? They play out early game like insanely cleanly. Um, and I think they are just the best fundamentals team in the league by a mile. Um, in terms of like how much I trust them to not, you know, have have a, a series like they did against Mad, where it kind of capitulates. I think they need to have a plan B. I think they need to be less predictable. I think that while they're very clean, they're a team that's very easy to study for because they basically do the same thing every game, essentially, at least again in the early game, right? So I think Mad Lions kind of found them out in that best of five series. And I think once they won the first game, it, they were never going to win that series, right? It was like kind of one of those things where even though they're two, one up, you actually kind of didn't feel like they were actually going to win the series, couldn't win the series anymore. Cause they basically got found out um, in terms of what you said earlier about Larson and how he's like imploded in, in uh, a few sort of key moments before. I don't really have the impression that he's like choking. I think he I think it's a case of actually he has had a couple of moments where he's just not performed well. I don't get really I don't really get choker vibes from Larson and uh Larson was actually it with H2K for a little bit, uh, a couple of weeks when we were having I can't remember what the thing was. Oh, selfie was not cleared by a doctor to play. So, right. um yeah, he ended coming coming in. I think he's a very calm guy. Like you say he's he's a bit of an oddball. Um but he's very calm, very sort of cerebral. Uh, I don't think he really loses his head on stage at all. I think if he has a bad game, it's probably because of bad decisions or bad, you know, picks or whatever, independent of his sort of uh, mental state or or how fretted his nerves are. So I don't think it's like a situation where, for example, as again, as you said earlier, maybe you could point to, to moments in Yankos' past where you could be like, nah, this guy choked. Like, usually this guy would just stomp this on this champion, sure. on this matchup. Nah, this is a straight-up choke. I don't see that in Larson. I think this guy is actually very consistent in, in sort of his headspace. I think that Rogue just become more predictable the longer series go on and i think they need to diversify what they do a lot more i mean even something like you have an amazing tool right of like you know the weak side king or whatever even that in itself even though it's a big strength is like super predictable right like i feel that they should be trying to get Otto like during the course of the regular season to play like quite a lot of uh carry roles and just sort of diversify how they set up their team because at the moment regardless of the champions they pick or what they pick into the game always goes the same way anyway when they have a modicum of control right and most games they do so yeah to me it's just they need to diversify more they need to become less predictable but they're still my favorite kind of because there's no one there's like not one team right now who's like above and beyond everyone else like we could agree that misfits look the best but we also probably all expect them to not be the de facto best come playoffs, right? So it, just because of their consistency, I automatically make rogue favorites. But I think if a team, another team goes on a run or, or mad to have, you know, another one of their sort of spells where they're able to become unpredictable and they get rogue early in playoffs, let's say, I would fear for rogue. Um, so what I want to mention is also, I actually think, so what you mentioned is they're very predictable. I think it's on the coaching staff in that case, because they do have players that are very diverse. Um, they can play a lot of different play styles, right? And Sama is very good at playing aggressive or passive. He's one of the few ADKs that can do both. And he's excellent at both. And same with Odo Amna, which is very rare to have. Sure. Most top laners and all AD carries are generally either all in or full defensive, right? Yes. So these players can actually play both play styles. They just have to try it. I think what I want to see from Rogue, if they want to improve further from being currently my best team, but to being like the solid best team, I think they need to try and play more aggressive and take more risk, right? Because as we talked about earlier, they're winning games and getting massive goal leads without any kills because they don't need to take those kills because they're just better as a team. But if they face a team that's equally good to them, then I think they're going to be lacking, for example, a Chinese team, because they're not aggressive enough to actually take those big risks that sometimes you do need to take. I actually agree with all of that. I, I didn't want to like just put it on the coaching staff because I'm not obviously I'm not sure about how the dynamics of the team work, but I would agree that my instinct is probably this team could be coached better, which is also kind of harsh because the way they play early game reminds me of like the way uh, Prodi used to coach when lane swaps first came in, right? 
like just ran like just beautiful macro that's getting them these like uh, big early game leads so i wouldn't take any in the same way that i would say i think they need to diversify and i would assign some of that blame to the coaching staff i think they also need to be praised for how insanely clean they are able to play their plan a right which is super clean but i i agree with you as well they have good enough players to to do like a quasi version of what g2 used to do every now and then when they have perks right of just creating these ma manic skirmishes when you have auto top when you have hands uh as your ad carry and you have larson in the mid lane these guys are all top two top three in their role like you should be able to brute force for i mean inspired as well for fuck's sake arguably mm -hmm. the best jungler in the league yes. like you should be able to brute force these scenarios where you can get picks and skirmishes and yeah I, if i'm then that's what i'm using the regular season for rogue will make playoffs they're in a similar position to g2 not quite as much pedigree but they're in a similar position where they shouldn't really be concerned too much about seeding they should be thinking like how can we make sure that what happened in the finals last year never happens again that should be their main play style just going back to these early game like smooth rotations and getting early gold, gold leads shouldn't be the end goal at all because even if you you know want to win lec or you think you can well win the lec by doing that you're not going to win worlds by doing that you need yes. a plan b regardless I would actually say along the lines, because obviously Wicked's point was about question of the coaching staff. That actually would be my biggest thing I would say about Rogue over the last two splits, actually, if you look at them as a team. It's like they always look like the moment plan A stops working they're fucking shit out of luck. Like, not only do they not have a plan B, but they just seem mad rattled by it as soon as people figure them out. Because, like, again, they either just steamroll you or people figure out some counter and in the playoffs if it's been like a pick or some comp related shit dude they, they can't recover in the same series they have to sort of go away go back to which is suggest by the way they just come up with a better plan here so i can't yeah i think you've i think you've nailed it on that one right the other team the last team i want to talk about because we just have to based on where they are in the league is fanatic of course so even though we already talked on this last episode about some of the improvements they made right the reason why i'm bringing, I'm bringing this up is this is the context people are missing fanatic right now is second they're on a five and two record but they play the worst two teams in the LEC next week so they have a very good chance that they could be number one because Misfits on the other hand who is number one right now plays against Mad Lions and G2 so there's a world where at the end of next week halfway through LEC summer Fnatic could be number one in the LEC so already I don't know anyone even the biggest Fnatic fan wasn't that coming with that angle at the beginning of this split so Wicked what do you think of this Fnatic? So I think we have to first give props to Brepo and Adam because sure. Brepo stepped out and done really well in the jungle. He's done what people expected he would be a good jungler, but people weren't sure about his replacement, right? I think Adam is... I knew he was talented and so on before, but often when a talented player comes in, they kind of tend to I fail, lost. like Chris did. Like Chris failed, for example, right? He didn't do as well as people expected. But Adam have just been smurfing every single game. There's been games where he didn't get the help he was supposed to have when he played all of versus Rennington, and he still dominated his lane 1v1 kills, 1v2, and so on. Like, this player have been absolutely phenomenal. I think he's been one of the best top laners, if not the best top laner so far in LEC. Thoughts, yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, I I actually think you know a, a, along the sort of uh, along the lines of, of betting, I actually would if I if I was a betting man myself, I'd put a cheeky bet on Schalke to beat Fnatic. I actually think that even though I don't uh, think he's like an amazing jungler or whatever, I think sort of stage Gilius compared to stage Kire is the biggest upgrade you'll see all season. Uh, I think. Uh, well, sorry, what did I say? Gilius Takira. Yeah, Gilius Takira. I think it's one of the biggest up upgrades you'll see all season. I think that Schalke could easily surprise um, Fnatic next split. And one of the... Re uh, next game. And one of the reasons I think that as well is because people forget, like, when Gilius had, like, his first sort of mini rena uh, renaissance in uh, LEC, I think he was playing on Vitality at the time. He was doing all these, like, super early game, like, level two cheese ganks and stuff like yes. this. I think this is actually where Bwipo's inexperience could come to bite him against a player like Gilius, who's willing to kind of do these sort of very nuanced um, sort of jungle early game cheesy stuff. He's playing his first game back. He, he's the kind of personality who's absolutely going to want to make a, a splash when he comes back, right? He's going to be properly uh, tweeting all kinds of mad shit just before the game. Like, I actually think this is like big upset potential this game. And I also just think that the level of Schalke with Gilius in an official game versus Kire 
is going to be massively improved. And again, that's not because I think Gilius is like some super sick jungler. I just think Kira is complete dog shit in officials. So I think you could, yeah, I think you could easily see an upset here. In terms of how Fnatic look overall, I agree. I think Whippo's looked as well as could possibly have been expected. I think he looks good. Like, I think, I think he's done well for himself. I do think his experience will be, or inexperience will be sort of found out more and more as the split goes on. Um, and I, you know, I wouldn't hold that against him at all if it did happen. For me, Adams, it's it's too soon for me to to really have strong feelings about Adam. And again, that's neither a bad thing or a negative thing. I think overall he's looked good. I think he's done his job well. I'm just not convinced because I wasn't convinced when he was in the ERLs. I felt that even though obviously his team won, I. <laughs> I felt that this guy had just ludicrous freedom that was created for him by the rest of the map because of how strong his team was in the other positions. Um, so, yeah, while I, th I think he's done completely fine, I think he's been good. Uh, and, yeah, it may well be that in a few weeks, I'm like, you know what? Yeah, Adam, he's a he's a really good player. I'm not convinced yet. And again, that's nothing negative towards him. I just need to see more. I just haven't seen enough of him. Oi! This video was kindly supported by Eddie, Chris with a K, Lager15, Pronogo, Shenlong, Zachary Carter, Zach Schmid, Adam Oaks, Alexander Rao, Animosity, Dean Tanglis, Doomseer, Eric Hillestad, Hades, J Dobbs, Jensen Go, John Shelton, Joseph Ginsberg, Kovacevic, Tobias Bernasconi, Zumba, and Xyrothenia, and as always, special thanks go out to my main man, Jerky's Minion. Want to suggest a topic or a guest? Do you want to ask a question in one of those AMAs? Do you want teasers? See who the guests are? Maybe you want to take part and chat with me in one of those esports discussions. Well, for all of the above, put your money where your mouth is, join the Patreon link in the description box below, and become a part of this Grilluminati.